Mary Ellen Pleasant, who I ran into in my favorite book about black excellence called Black Fortunes. And um, do, you, do you know who she is? Have you ever heard of her? I am not familiar, but I'm learning along with everybody else every day with, from some of the, uh, the history makers. I thought I knew black history. I do not know all the stuff that, that you've been sharing, and I love it. All right. Well, she was born somewhere between 1814 and 1817. But, you know, you know, folk of of colored hue, uh, you know, their birthday wasn't very important sometimes. Uh, maybe it was August 19th. That that has been disputed, maybe. Um, and um, even that year has been disputed. Uh, some claim that she had been born in Georgia but some state in her autobiography that she was born in Philadelphia. She's a mysterious woman, and I'm bringing her up today because it's Thrive Thursday. At the time of her death, Mary Ellen Pleasant would have been worth today's dollars, $600 million. Yes, one of the wealthiest people in this country. How did she become wealthy? Well, uh, she worked her way out of bondage, first of all. I'm going to just talk about the identity of her parents, unknown. She wrote that her mother was a full-blooded Negress from Louisiana, and her father was Hawaiian. I don't know that that's true, but because when you have that much agency, you get to craft your own story, and I like that. <laughs> I like that, right? right. And, her, and, and another version of her memoir, she, um, who she dictated to her goddaughter, it was wrote down that she was born into bondage and that her mother was a voodoo priestess. And her father was John Hampton Pleasant, the youngest son of the governor of Virginia. Okay. She arrived in Nantucket, Massachusetts in 1827, around there as a 10 to 13 year old child in bondage. And she worked, ironically enough, for a Quaker short shopkeeper, because you know, the Quakers were abolitionists, right? Yeah. She worked her way out of bondage. So how, you know, there's so much hypocrisy and complication and complicity, even watching a little bit of that, um, Black church, the 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 um uh the Methodists were uh was it the Methodists or the Presbyterians? One of them, they were against slavery, or mm -hmm. they were against um baptizing black people into Christianity because then they would have to free them according to their own spiritual uh, laws, uh, right? Uh, but they figured out a way around that where we're gonna take these heathens and make them Christians, but they're they're not us. They're, so this is really the emergence of this whiteness. Because they're black, they're not worthy. They're not worthy of being free. They should be in bondage, but we at least can save their souls. You know, mm. it, man, y'all be turning yourselves into pretzels to try to make sense of your hypocrisy and all of the lies that are told out there. But anyway, uh, she she worked her way out of bondage, and um, she became a life uh, lifelong friend to Governor Hussey's granddaughter. And they became deeply involved in the abolitionist movement in Massachusetts. And she married a man named James Smith, who was a wealthy flower contractor and plantation owner who had freed his, so she married a white man, who had freed his people in bondage and was able to pass as white. So he wasn't white. Mm. And she also could pass for white. So these two white looking people, her husband owned people, freed them. They got together and she worked on the Underground Railroad until his death. And they transported people from, the, from bondage into Ohio and as far north as Canada. And she was very, she was in many ways the Harriet Tubman of California because they moved out to California where because of her complexion, she was able to work among some of the wealthiest in California. And she had like a uh, catering business, what would be considered a catering business today. And in those places, she was catering for all of these highbrow, the governors and the, you know, the bankers, and she would get all of these tips and bring them back to the people. And of course, at the same time, getting people to freedom, she right. was investing. Oh, she got a tip. She would go out and, uh, and she was amassing a great amount of wealth. And she was able to spend that wealth uh, into a lot more wealth because she was super smart. And um, she, she met uh, at one of these meetings, at one of these uh, catering events that she did, she met uh, most of the founders of the city that she, she catered these lavish parties. And um, among them, she engaged with uh, this guy named Thomas Bell, who, at, who was at the Bank of California, and they began to make money based on her tips and her guidance. So she was the genius behind. So he was part of the bank, but she was like, like let's invest in this, let's invest in that. Thomas made money of his own, especially in Quicksilver. And by 1875, they together had amassed a $30 million fortune. Woo! Which in today's 
dollars would be six hundred and forty seven million dollars. Uh, and the partnership was seen as illicit because she had this giant mansion. Uh, she had a lot of people working in it and they, they thought it was a brothel. Um, upon his death, she finally came out as black. She was hiding it for so long. And of course, everybody turned on her because, yeah. you know, how dare you, darky? But she wasn't very dark. She wasn't even dark. <laughs> which is the weird thing about race, you know, like and, and when people didn't know she was the belle of the city, the yeah. belle of the, you know, San Francisco. When they found out all of a sudden overnight, she went from being somebody that was respected to not being respected just because now you know that I'm black. How weird is that? They started calling her Mammy, Mammy Pleasant. Uh, but I bring her up because, you know, I, I was talking with Carr on Saturday about allies mm -hmm. and like, we need to have people in places like the spook that sat by the door, Sam Greeley yeah. and others, you know, to be able to extract the information and bring it back. Because in Judas in the Black Messiah, it's always, you know, our organization is being infiltrated. Yeah. You know, this is a woman that no one knew was black, was able to get information and bring it back, build wealth, free people, invest. You know, she, a lot of black owned businesses uh, were invested in by this woman, Mary Ellen Pleasant. She's not a household name. And I feel like, you know, in many ways, it's the kind of thing that you, you hope for, right? When people can pass and walk into, they never turn, they, they never come back because they want to be done with being black. But yeah. you're never done with being black, Ever. you know? And so people like Mary Ellen Pleasant, Pleasant um, Plessy from Plessy versus Ferguson, who could pass as well, you know, mm -hmm. for white and chose to get on that train to buck a system that was silly and antiquated and, and just undermining and evil. This we need more of. And yep. these conversations we need more of. We, you know, we're going to talk about colorism and all this other stuff. Um, with Coming to America, I saw, um, uh, what, I forgot, the, the one that barked and she said there was a lot of colorism on the set of Coming to America, the first one. The first one, really? Yeah, um, and we have that, you know, but we rarely talk about folk that have crossed over and then, you know, Harriet Tubman did her thing, but Mary Ellen, not but, and Mary Ellen Pleasant probably freed just as many people right. passing. And think about this too, um, Karen, is that imagine if you have if you have the money and the agency because, and the agency piece because people think you're white, that you can actually buy people out of bondage a lot more easily than you could if you were if you were trying to do it as a black presenting person right so you got to think about too the stealthiness of that of using of using your your ability to pass think of all of the people all of the people in bondage that you could purchase and then free right no way you could do that on the flip side of that. And I, I like that she waited to the end, basically the end of her life to uh, go. She went to the city directory. She didn't have to do that and yeah. change her designation. She went yeah. to the city directory and changed her racial designation from white to black. Basically, basically to, to say, say, ha ha, yes, yes. guess what? <laughs> ha, yes, you dummies. Oh, right. I love this story.